Not really. I'm just joking you. I have a dry sense of humor. All right. Let's go ahead and get back to our presentation. Right? So that's just a basic example of what JavaScript can do. Um, let's talk a little bit more about JavaScript, because you see this script on the screen. You see all the, this dot notation occurring, all these other things that, that are really unfamiliar to us coming from HTML and CSS. JavaScript relies on functions to perform a lot of, or rather to provide a lot of the functionality that we get out of it. Uh, a function is a group of statements that are, are simply combined to perform a specific task. Um, and so this right here, this whole thing is a function. And a statement is just simply a line of code that performs an action. So this line of code down there at the bottom creates an alert box that will pop up that says, you just did something awesome. It will actually take your name, too. Um, if different parts of a script repeat the same task, then, then it's probably a pretty good idea for you to go ahead and, and take those different parts, create a function, and then do something called calling the function later in your script. Okay? And we'll actually show you how to do that here in just a moment. Um, first things first, though, let's talk about how to define one of these functions. You've got a couple of different parts. You've got your function keyword, right? Every function starts off with function. You've got your function name. In this case, we have hello world. And then we have a statement, right? Alert happens to be a method, right? And then we have what alert is going to present to us. So it's going to create an alert box that says hello world. Everything between the curly braces is often referred to as a code block. So just a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, you know, whether, like what you refer to, to a, a JavaScript function as, um, you know, whether it's a code block or whatever it happens to be, whether you're calling it a function, that stuff isn't necessarily going to be tested on the exam, but you should definitely be aware of the vocabulary that's used on a regular basis. Um, I'm self-taught, and so I still make a couple of mistakes every now and then because I didn't have like a really awesome teacher who told me how to pronounce everything properly. Um, so a lot of it is me trying to just sort of figure things out online, and so definitely don't don't worry if you're messing things up or if you feel like you're not doing things right. Like I said, the best way to learn this is by experimentation. And then, then try to link up with some really, really smart, great, skilled people later. Um, they'll definitely help you out quite a bit too. Okay? Um, so let's talk about naming functions. A function can have any name. Our last one was hello world. Um, but there are a couple of guidelines that you have to consider. Right? We don't want to use anything, or sorry, any of the reserved words that are defined by JavaScript standards. And these are words that, um, that may be used in the future. Also, we don't want to use keywords that are used with HTML, um, CSS, anything of that nature. Um, try to name the function specifically um, after the action that it's performing. Right? Um, I've got a quick link there that you can, can take a look when you, at when you download the... Uh, the presentation to, to notice all the different reserved words in JavaScript. Um, the name also has to be made of letters, digits, underscores, or dollar signs. It cannot, absolutely cannot start with a number. Cannot. That's tested. I remember that being on my exam, actually, um, not too long ago. So, Another important thing to point out is that there's a difference between how you define a function and then how you execute it. Um, the way that a function is defined is different from how it's executed by a browser. Uh, the definition clearly outlines names, um, its parameters that it may take, like a, a value such as somebody's name, um, and then also its statements. Um, when a function is called, however, the browser actually executes all the statements within the function. Um, very different from just defining it whereas those statements aren't ran by the browser. They aren't executed. They just sit there until they're called upon. So here's an example at the bottom of the screen of, of defining a function, right? We're going to do something awesome. That's the name of our function. And then we call the function. So when we click a button that says click me, we're actually going to do something awesome. All right. Another thing that's really important with, with JavaScript is, is uh, understanding variables. Scripts have to temporarily store pieces of information like your first name, your last name, your date of birth, um, anything else that you might use when you're playing a video game or doing something like that. Um, 
these bits of data, they're stored as variables. Um, they're called variables because those values can vary based on whoever happens to be using an application or a website. And, and you know, you might even change those variables um, each time that you use it or use a website or use an app. Um, variables are simply defined with the var syntax with a unique keyword such as height or width, right? And so here, um, I've got an example. You've got your variable keyword. Then you have a name, height. Um, we might want to change it to like building height or ceiling height or something along those lines um, in order to, to specify what it happens to be the height of. We have an assignment operator. Here it's the equal sign. And so what happens is we're taking the value 6 and we're saying, hey, 6 is going to be temporarily stored in the variable height. And 6, of course, happens to be our variable value here. Okay, just some, some fun stuff to learn. Um, there are some rules for naming variables. Um, take a look at these. These are super important. It'll help you pick and select really great names for your variables, and, and it'll make sure that you don't, um, don't present yourself with any problems when you're developing for the web. Okay? Um, lastly, I want to talk about a couple of different data types or types of data, right? Uh, you can store numbers inside of variables, so one, two, three, four, five, and so on. You can store strings of characters, like uh, zombies freak me out can be stored in a variable. Um, the one thing with, uh, with strings is that they have to always be surrounded by quote marks. So if I have uh, var words, and I could say I like stuff. I really do, so I'm going to use an exclamation mark. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, make sure that I add the ending quote mark around the outside of it. Um, that would go ahead and store this entire sentence, this entire string, inside of the variable words. Uh, we could also store true and false values, known as booleans, inside of, of variables as well. So lots of stuff to keep in mind and keep track of, but as you continue to program, you'll know this stuff like the back of your hand. Um, finally, if you want to want to add comments to your JavaScript code, you can add single line comments with two forward slashes, and then just like with CSS, you can add uh, multi line comments with a forward slash and then a, a asterisk, right? And you've got to add that pair, and then of course the ending um, asterisk and, and forward slash as well, right? So keep those things in mind. All right. Um, real quickly, JavaScript is wonderful, but it can be really challenging to use when you're just getting started. And there are other JavaScript libraries that are available um, that, that are entirely comprised of code that other programmers have already developed. And so you've got pre-written functions and statements that you can use in order to create your programs, and it, it can save you a lot of time and effort. Um, you can use these libraries by linking their files to your web page, just like you do with your own JavaScript files. Um, one of the most important ones is jQuery, right? Or rather, not, not necessarily important. It's not necessarily more important than any of the others, but it's, it's definitely really, really popular. And it allows you to use CSS-like selectors and its methods to perform functions with minimal code. Um, do yourself a favor and do a quick Bing search for jQuery. You'll come up with so much information. And there's, there are a lot of online tutorials available for you, and I strongly recommend that you take a look at them. It's definitely worth your time. You'll be able to do a lot of really cool things in learning about jQuery. Okay. All right, next, um, let's talk about locating and accessing elements. Um, JavaScript relies entirely on objects, okay? And HTML object or HTML elements are objects, right? Just like houses and cars in real life. Kind of crazy to, to think about that. Um, every time I say it out loud, it just sort of uh, throws me off a little bit. But just as with real life objects, we can modify HTML objects um, and the way that they appear on the screen or the way that they act and function. Um, <clears throat> These objects that appear on our screen are, are typically grouped into things called object models, which are used to represent browsers and web pages. And so, so this whole thing right here is a window object. And everything on the inside of it 
right, is part of the document object. And so you'll see that we'll say document.write. We used that in an earlier example. Um, that's what we're referring to when we say document, okay? Um, the document object model creates a model of a web page. And so, um, as I just mentioned, talking about the document object, that's what the document object model uh, refers to. All right, we use it to update content, structure, and styles on the fly, and, and this guy right here is super important for us. Um, we're going to reference that a lot, especially in these next couple of examples. Um, another important aspect of this is to think about the fact that uh, this document object is actually made up of a bunch of other objects as well, and so it has child objects that represent each of the individual elements on a page. And so you, know, you see a lot of them like title and head, and then we have body and div, and then our, of course our paragraphs, and then our, our text. This guy should not be there. It's not supposed to have an end bracket, but um, text is definitely a child object. So. All right, so we can locate and access these elements by using the, uh, the get element by ID method. And this is something that's definitely going to be tested on the exam. Um, we access the document object. We make reference to it, right? We use the get element by ID method for the document object. And then we add in the parameter here of demo. And demo is actually going to be an, a specific element's ID. And this means, of course, that the element must have an ID or else this won't work and we can't access it. Um, we use this method to go ahead and manipulate the contents of it. And so let's go ahead and take a look at, at that in action, all right? All right, so I'm opening up my get element demo. Um, what we want to do right here is we're going to go ahead and, and get today's date and add it to an element on the page. So I'm actually going to use another element that we're going to talk about in just a moment called dot enter HTML. It's another method, right? We're going to access this paragraph element by its ID, and then we're going to set it's inner HTML, everything that happens to be in between these two tags to today's date. Let's see how this works. Boom, there it is. Pacific Daylight Time 2. It even gives you the time zone. That is exciting. And every time you refresh, notice how it updates the time. Pretty cool stuff. All right. So now, Back to the presentation, and we'll actually be using the get element by ID method uh, just a couple more times. Um, another thing that you have to be prepared to do when creating really engaging web apps is, is listen and respond to events. So when we, when we uh, interact with a web page, we're doing a lot of clicking, we might do scrolling, and maybe we're actually um, touching it on a tablet or on, on our, our home PC. And so we've got to be prepared to build a web page that is going to listen for, for mouse clicks or listen for touches and taps so that, that it interacts properly um, with, with what we intend to do with the web page, right? So that it responds in the proper way. So let's talk about some events in programming. Um, you have form submission, so you press the submit button, you have keystrokes, you type keys, um, you make a click on a touchpad or a mouse, uh, maybe the page just loads or unloads, and then you also may select items. Well, there are event handlers like on submit, on key down, on click, on load, and on select that 